All right, well, if you'll take your Bible, turn to uh, Luke chapter 11. And uh, if any of you are wondering where my best friend is, he heard me at 8.30, so he's not here. (laughs) Slacker. So much for a best friend. But um, this morning, what we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about being a true friend here at Del Norte Baptist Church. Uh, What what does that look like uh, to be a true friend? Uh, not just a friend in word, but a friend in deed. The old adage is a friend in need is a friend in deed. That uh, if you drive a Toyota pickup truck and you get stuck in the mud, then you call your friend Wade to come pull you out uh, because your little Toyota just couldn't make it out of that mud puddle. Um, and um, if you uh, remember... About 21 years ago, back in 1995, uh, Pixar took the world by storm with a movie called Toy Story that was all about the friendship of Buzz and Woody. And we're not going to sing, You've Got a Friend in Me, but we, we all know how that song goes. You know, when the road gets rough ahead, you know, you got a friend in me. And we all need those kinds of friends in our life. And if we think about church and church life, uh, these should be some of the dearest friends that we have. These should be one of the groups that in our time of greatest need that we could call upon. And Jesus, as he is uh, preaching one of his parables, which is nothing more than an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, uh, he introduces a scenario of two friends having a conversation. And it paints for us a picture that uh, in 300 BC, there was a Latin term that meant a sure friend is known when in difficulty. And in this parable, there's a friend that's got a difficulty. And so he goes to a friend and we would think, well, surely to goodness, if, if Jesus is talking about this and it's in the Bible, then, then this friend is going to be just that. He's going to be a friend, but you'd be wrong. Look at it with me in Luke chapter 11, verses five through eight. This is Jesus. And it says, and he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight And say to him, friend, lend me three loaves or give me some bread, man. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you that though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of the persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. When we think about friendships, when we think about being a true friend here at Del Norte Baptist Church, there are some paradigms that we see Jesus laying out in this parable that we should also see fleshed out here in the church. Uh, Our friendship with one another should not be limited to convenience. You know, we have these wonderful little stores that we call convenience stores. And the whole idea is, oh, well, we can just run in there. It'll be more convenient to stop there. And it'll cost you three times as much to stop there. But we do it. Why? Because it's convenient. Well, when we think about our friendships, our friendships should not be limited to convenience. I mean, if you looked up the definition of convenience, I mean, it's a noun that means the state of being able to proceed with something with little effort or difficulty. In other words, it should be so easy that that's what makes it convenient. Folks, it's easy to be friends when everything is going good. It's easy to be friends when the time is right, but 12 o'clock at night, I mean, any of y'all ever got those phone calls at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning? You up? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Just laying here waiting on the phone to ring. Matter of fact, been laying here since 10 o'clock waiting on the phone to ring. You know, we, we get those phone calls that they don't come at convenient times, but when it's a friend on the other line and they forget that there's a two-hour difference between Albuquerque and South Carolina and they just want to talk, you, you talk to them. Just saying, you know. To say the least, in this parable, 
uh, his friend has showed up at the door at the most inconvenient of times. But supposedly, this was his friend. I mean, Jesus says, who of you has a friend? And he pre presents this example. Our friendship with one another, uh, let me say to you, cannot be based on our convenience because there will always be times that there is not enough time. There will always be those situations that will not be ideal situations. Uh, my associate pastor, Miles Bridges, who uh, many of you met this time last year when we came in for our pre-site trip and got stuck in the snow because it never snows in Albuquerque. And we spent extra days in Albuquerque because it does snow in Albuquerque. And then our summer mission team was here. Inevitably, at the end of the day, I will go to his office. He will come to my office. Anything I can do for you, anything you need, and we'll do this. And we're not saying $6. We're saying six hours. If you can just find me six more hours, I think I can get everything done that I need to get done. But the reality of it is God gives us 24 hours a day. Doesn't give us 30. And what we do with that time oftentimes determines if in those moments that a friend comes calling that is in need, that it determines whether or not it's convenient or not. But regardless of that, if we truly are friends here at Del Norte Baptist Church, and if we truly are friends, then it does not matter. But what about out there in the real world? Not about on a Sunday when somebody comes up and they say, oh, so-and-so's got sick, they're not here, could, could you do nursery duty? And we go, oh yeah, absolutely, you know. But what about out there in the real world? What about when you're, you're doing these things and, and you're going through life and then you find yourself in that situation that it takes a lot of effort and it is difficult because it's not convenient. Uh, years ago, I was playing golf with a friend of mine and we had hit our tee shots and, and mine was right down the middle and his had kind of drifted on the other side of a creek. And when we got up to where the ball was at, I was like, dude, let me just drive you back across the bridge. Oh no, dude, I can jump it. I can jump it. I mean, we're up here and the creek banks down here and the creek's only five feet wide. I got this. I'm like, okay, sure enough, he jumped it. I'm like, he called it, he jumped it took his club out, hit the shot, hit it almost up at the green. I'm like, man, he called his shot. That's awesome. And then came time to come back. And he made it across the creek. But when his feet hit the bank, the mud went up to his knees and it was like the old nesty plunge. And he falls back in that creek and he's flailing. Drowning, I'm drowning, and I'm like, I'm dying, I'm dying, and I'm trying to get a golf club, and I'm saying, Brad, just grab the club, man, <laughs> grab the club, don't go toward the light, go toward the nine iron, man. <laughs> and it could not have happened at a better time. July 6th, on my birthday, I have gotten all kinds of gifts over the years. I'm 43 years old, that is still the best gift I've ever got <laughs> in my life. But that was all birthed out of a very inconvenient situation. Now, it's more inconvenient for him than it was me. But, you know, when, when we think about our friendships, you know, Solomon in his wisdom in Proverbs 17, when he, when he talks about friendship and he talks about friends, in Proverbs 17, 17, at the beginning of that scripture, he says to us, a friend loves at all times. And that means that a friend loves at all times, not the convenient times, not the scheduled times, but at all times. I mean, you take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have all the times. Some of y'all in your mind are doing the Facts of Life theme song, but, <laughs> but that's, that's really what friendship is. I mean, you take the good and you, you take the bad, you, you mash them all in there together, and, and that's all the times of being a friend. You know, it's not about always agreeing. It's not about always wanting to do the same thing necessarily. It's not always about having the same plan to how accomplish a goal. But it's saying, you know what? We're friends. And according to the word of God, I'm going to love you at all times. Because there is no provision for convenience when it comes to being a true friend. Because it's that friendship that's there at all times. 
And it's not that fair weather friend. You know, we probably all have had those people in our life that were just, oh man, I, I'm, I'll be there for you. If you ever need me, man, all you gotta do is call me. And we've called him like, dude, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not really convenient. And you're like, well, I'll never call them again. Why? Because they were just that, that fair weather friend. Or think about friendships here at the church. I mean, so many times in churchdom, we're really good at putting on masks and we're really good at speaking Christianese. You know, we, we sometimes, we go King James on people when we come to church. How doest thou, brethren? Oh, we doeth well. How doth thine and thine family do? Oh, we are highly favored and blessed we are. And people are standing around going, what state are they from? Is that South Carolinian or Alabamian? I mean, or Texan? I mean, what, what, what kind of language is that? It's called fake. It's what it is. And folks, if, if there's ever a place in this world where we can be real with one another, it's got to be in the church. And if there's ever a place in this world that we can have true friendships that are not predicated upon convenience, then it's got to be within the church. I mean, convenience, that state of being able to proceed with something with little effort or difficulty. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with that in your friendships? I mean, are, are there some people that, that you've just cut ties with because they were just too high maintenance? I mean, I, I've, I've had some of those high maintenance friends. They're, they were called ex-girlfriends. I mean, they were just like, I'm not putting up with this. But then I've had guys over the years that they're just too high maintenance. And it just, it just wasn't worth the effort. Why? Because it became too inconvenient to continue on with that friendship. Here in the church, we can't ever get to that point. Here in the church, we can never get to the point that we terminate friendships simply for convenience sake. I mean, yeah, he shows up at midnight and it's not a very convenient time. But when we think about our friendships and we think about our friendships with one another within the church body, we should be able to share our friendships with mutual friends that we have. Look at the whole reason why he shows up. He doesn't show up at midnight just to ruin his night. There's a reason behind it. Look at what he says in verse number six. The guy that's outside the door, he says, friend, a friend of mine has come to me on this journey and, and I have nothing to set before him. Lend me three loaves is how he ends verse number five. You know, with this, this, this concept of our friendships being mutual friendships and the thought of being mutual means having the same specified relationship with each other. Your friend is my friend too, but that definition does not say the exact same connection, but the connection. See, so many times we're connected to people through other people. You know, I'm connected to guys like Wade and Richard through Brad. That had Brad never come out here, I would have never met Wade and Richard. And you've got people in your life that you're connected to them, not because of you, but because of your friends. And then because they were friends with this person, they became your friend and this mutual friendship begins to take place. But even though he acknowledges to him, he says, it's a friend of mine. It's not one of our buddies. It's, it's not even anybody you know. It's a friend of mine that has shown up, but, but you're my friend. And, and by default, you should be the one person I should be able to call on because, because you're my friend. I mean, think back, you parents. We're all in this together. Didn't you get so sick of High School Musical when that came out? Because your kids played it over and over and over. And you're just like... Yes, we're all in this together, and that DVD is going to disappear, you know? Yes, oh yes, my brothers, yes, you know? But if you think about it, church, man, we're all in this together. I mean, we're all in this thing called life. We're all in this body that Christ has grafted us into, and we're in it together together. And we have these friendships that have been birthed within our life through mutual friends that we have. And, and so many times because you and I treat each other the way that we treat each other, then those mutual friends see that and they get drawn to that. I mean, folks, look around. Look at the empty chairs. There's probably not a one of you that couldn't think of a friend that you wished were here today. 
There's probably one of, not one of you that's thinking about a coworker that you wish, man, I've been trying to get them to come and they won't come. And it may not be through you that God uses to get them to come. It may be through a friend of yours here that for whatever reason, they connect and they go, okay, man, see you at church Sunday. And you're like, what? I've been asking you for six months. Why, why, did you, why are you not coming for me, but you're coming for them? Is it, does it really matter? If they're coming, I mean, that's what matters. If they're coming to hear the good news, if they're coming to hear the truth of the gospel, that's what matters. And maybe, just maybe, there are some friendships that you've got that if they became mutual friends with some of your friends here within the church body, that they might become friends as well. Because the dynamic that we talked about with the men this weekend, when we talked about being men of God and the need to have friends in our life, if you'll look back over to Proverbs, once again, Solomon in his wisdom in Proverbs 17, he says, a friend loves at all time. And then over in Proverbs 18, 24, he says, a man that has friends must show himself to be friendly. Or a woman that has friends must show herself to be friendly. Or a teenager that has friends must show themselves to be friendly. There, there must be this innate ability within us to compel people and not repel people. To, to draw them to the Christ that lives within us instead of repelling them from wanting to have anything to do with us. And the way we do that is by building these networks of friendships out of mutual friends with other people and it just continues to grow and grow. Folks, let me tell you something. It takes teamwork to do God's work. In the first service, your pastor got up and bragged on the staff and the volunteers. I mean, between the men's retreat and the women's conference and the couple's banquet last night and even baptism today and the orchestra and everything that has taken place, it would be impossible for one person to do all of these things. It takes teamwork. And if Del Norte Baptist Church is gonna be serious about doing God's work, then we're gonna to have to do it through teamwork. And that teamwork is going to be made possible through these friendships that we create because folks, whether you realize it or not, you exist for those who are not here. You don't exist for your comfort. You don't exist for, for your wants and your perceived needs. You exist for these empty chairs to be filled with people that are far from God coming to hear the good news of the gospel and their life being changed the same way that your life has been changed. We've got to get to this point that we begin to see people outside these church walls as not them, but as those, those that we engage, those that we befriend, and those that we try to find avenues to bring them in. And sometimes that takes place through those mutual friendships that you have created within this church family. The other thing I want you to see in verse number seven is that our friendship with one another can't be true friendship, you know, if we look for excuses. You know, if we, if we have developed these friendships that we just continually look for excuses of how not to be a friend, then that's not really a friendship because look at what the guy says in verse number seven. He says, and, and, and he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to me. You know, what, what does this friend do? He, he makes an excuse. He gives him a reason or an explanation and puts forward to defend or to justify why he won't do that which is being asked of him to do. Well, you know, I, I would, but, well, I really wish I could help, but, you know, anytime we put those buts out there, we're just creating excuses. And the body of Christ, for far too long, we have made way too many buts. We have made way too many excuses of, well, we can't reach that people group because of this. And we can't reach that age group because of this. And when we start getting to the point that we say, you know what, the kingdom of God is worth putting aside any excuse that's out there, then we begin to see God begin to bless. I mean, put, put yourself in this guy's shoes for just a moment. There's this knock on the door. And you hear the voice and you recognize the voice and you're like, you have got to be kidding me. It is 12 o'clock at night. The door is shut. Everybody 
is laying down. You know our baby has colic and you know we've been up every night with the triplets because they will not quit coughing and now we are asleep and we're all in bed and now you're knocking at my door asking me to come help you? Are you crazy, man? And we look at this and we look at it today and the dynamic is so different. You know, back then it was true. Hey, we're, we're, we're all in bed together. You know, we've just laid down. The, the children are with me. We just got to sleep. But now it's mom and dad have got their room and little Susie's got her room and little Billy's got his room and then there's the family room and then there's the living room and then there's the dining room and then there's this mythical place called the kitchen and then there's the bonus room and then they've got all of these rooms that are in the house. And we would look at this and we're like, well, I can't really relate to this. Well, think about it this way. You're laying there and it's not somebody knocking on your door, but your phone begins to buzz. And you look at it and you're like, why in the world are they calling me? Or you're in your bedroom and your phone's turned off and they've been trying to call you and they can't call you and they can't get you and they're throwing rocks at your window and you're like, what in the world is that? Or you, you hear them outside going, ka -ka, ka -ka, and you're like, what is that? And then you arise from your slumber and you hear this voice say, hey buddy, I need three loaves of bread. Can you hook me up? And you're like, have you lost your mind? There will always be a reason to make an excuse. There will always be a reason to say why we can't do that which we are called to do. But if we are truly friends, then there's no excuse too big. It can't be, well, they like Alabama and I like Clemson. Well, they like Denver and I like Carolina. Well, we're losers and they're winners. Well, they drive a Toyota and they drive a truck and they drive a Honda Davidson and they drive a Harley Davidson and they wear Nikes and they wear Converse. And I mean, we could come up with every excuse in the book and as the body of Christ, I hate to admit it, but we have, we've come up with every excuse in the book to not truly be friends with those that need to hear the good news of the gospel. But true friendship does not look for excuses. It seeks to look for opportunities to be a blessing. If you've got your Bible, turn over to um, Acts chapter 20. Um, in the book of Acts, we are, we are seeing the birth of the early church and through everything that's taking place, uh, we're seeing miracles taking place, people that are lame getting up and walking. Uh, we are seeing persecution. We have seen the first martyrdom of the church. We have seen the first uh, resurrection of a dead person named Tabitha uh, is raised to life. We, we are seeing all of these things take place. We have, we have learned about this man named Saul who was persecuting the church, but on the Damascus road, he is confronted with Christ. And by the time we get to chapter 11, he is no longer called Saul. He is called Paul. And to the point that when we get to Acts number 20, this is Paul writing to the little church that had been planted there in Ephesus, this little church plant. And he reminds them about the example that he had set. And he says, in everything that I did, not, not everything I told you to do, but in everything that I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. That by this kind of laboring through difficulty, by this willingness to make no excuse, be an excuse worthy to keep us from helping the weak. He says that we must help the weak. And then he throws the ace card. <laughs> A lot of people don't like it when preachers use the ace card. Look at what he says. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Man, that just gets real uncomfortable sometimes. Because we're listening to the preacher and we're like, ah, yeah, whatever, whatever. And, and then he says, but don't forget what Jesus said. And you're like, oh man, this is what Jesus said? Yeah, look at what Jesus said. The Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul reminds them, I made no excuse. I did everything I could indeed. I did everything I could to show you by the pattern of my life. I did everything I could to not make excuses. 
And when we see those friends that are in our life in need, then their need becomes our need. Their burden becomes our burden. We are to bear one another's burdens. We are to be a friend to the friendless because folks, when we're not, we are no better than the priest or the Levite that was there on the road. And when these two spiritual giants pass by and see this man laying in the ditch, they, they look and they keep going and they pass by on the other side. And then the most unlikely of people shows up, this Samaritan. And we learn the story of the good Samaritan who when we look at the story, it says that he dressed his wounds and he picked him up and he put him on his beast. And folks, I'm gonna tell you something. Sometimes having true friendships means that we've gotta get our hands dirty, that we gotta do life together, that we've gotta be there, that, that even though we don't know the answer, we're still there in the midst of the question. And he takes him to the inn and he gives the innkeeper money and he says, you take care of this guy and if when I come back, I owe you anything else, then I will repay you. And if we'll remember the words of Jesus, that it is more blessed to give than to receive, then no matter what a friend or a mutual friend may require of us, no matter how convenient or how inconvenient it may be, then we will give. And we will be that true friend that they need because we will not make excuses. Last point in verse number eight is that our friendship with one another in the hard times must be willing to persevere. Our friendships in those inconvenient times, it must be willing to persevere. Look at, look at what Jesus says. He says, I say to you, Though this guy was a jerk and not a good friend, well, that's kind of how I interpret it, but he says, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend. Make no mistake about it. This is not some random stranger that has shown up at his door. This is his friend. He says, and even though this guy gives every excuse in the book not to do what his friend is asking him to do, Jesus says, Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Because the friend on the outside doesn't give up on the friend on the inside. Because of that perseverance, because of that willingness to persevere, to continue on a course of action, even in the face of difficulty with little or no indication of success. That's what it means to persevere. Parents, if you're raising teenagers, we know what you're going through. We've got a 14-year-old son and a 17-year-old daughter. And they're just convinced that they know everything. But they don't know anything. But if they knew that they didn't know anything, they would know something, but they don't even know that. But they're just convinced, Dad, you're an idiot. I mean, why, why shouldn't you give me the money? I mean, you make money, I spend money. That's the partnership. You're like, no, that's not how it works, Caleb. I mean, I mean uh, son, you know? But, but when, we, when we've got this, parents, let me say to you, persevere. Don't give up on them. I, I am so glad that when I was the age of my son and I thought I knew everything, and I still remember how old I was when I got my last whooping. Now, in New Mexico, I don't know if y'all have whoopings, unless it happens on a field of sports, but back home, that means to get a spanking, or a whipping, or a blackout, or whatever you want to call it. But I remember I was 16 years old, and my dad had come in from work, and there was, there was I don't know if it was laundry or something that was supposed to be folded, and he said, boy, I told you to fold that laundry. I said, I ain't gonna do it. He said, say what? I said, he said, boy, if you don't fold that laundry, I'm gonna wear you out. I said, I have you, I'm 16 years old. I, and that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> I mean, I did not know my daddy was a Spaniard, but you'd have sworn he was Zorro. That belt, <laughs> I mean, he was like He-Man and he was on grace going, I have the power and <laughs> I remember waking up and saying, Daddy, you want these towels folded double or triple? How you want them folded? <laughs> Parents, don't give up on them. That's right. 
You teenagers, don't listen to me for just a second. Yes, they're idiots, but there's hope for them. If you don't give up on them, persevere. I love what my father-in-law has told me and Haley. He says, well, I want you to know, grandchildren, they're God's reward for not killing your own children. <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't know how many's coming, but they're going to be awesome. I mean, them triplets, Ira, they're going to be awesome, man. You know? But we as parents and we as church members, we go through those stages that man, we don't want to persevere. Because we look at it and we see the difficulty and we see there's low indication of success, but it's in those hard times that we have to persevere the most for one another. It's in those times that we have to persevere the most for the church, for the cause of Christ. Because he is the one that unites us. That yes, you may pull for this team and I pull for this team and you may like this brand and I may like this brand and we may have all of these things that divide us but the one thing that unites us in the church is Jesus. And when you look at Romans chapter 12, oh man, in verse four and five, it drives it home because it, it is a picture of what we're seeing right here today. Listen to what it says. He says, for as we have many members... Many members of Del Norte Baptist Church are here. Many members were in the 830 service. Many members are in the, the Hispanic service. He says, for as we have many members in one body, but they're all the members, but they do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. See, it's, it's not under the banner of Del Norte Baptist Church. It's under the banner of Christ. Amen. The banner over Christ is love. The, the, the symphony that we march to is the melody of what Christ has done in our lives. And though we are many members and though we are different in so many different ways, we are still one body and it's true of our physical bodies that's that's why he uses this example I mean back in 2008 when they found that there was a cyst at the base of my brain the size of a baseball and I endured brain surgery and then contracted meningitis and then endured another brain surgery and spent a month in the hospital during all of that time my hands didn't say well we're done with him and then when I came home, I'm like, Haley, where, where are my hands? They, they were still a part of the body. And when I blew out the discs in my back for the second time, my feet didn't say, well, time to get stepping, boys. He's falling apart on us. No, I came out of surgery and I'm like, hey, my feet are still there because they're, they're part of this body. That yes, it, it may be broken down, but... Let me tell you something, this body is not designed to last forever, but that which is inside of it is. The spirit is designed to last forever. And these earthen vessels in which we live, oh yes, they ache and they hurt and they break down and they let us down. But there is a spirit inside each of us that yearns to be filled with a relationship of its creator. And in the midst of those hardships, in the midst of the times that it would have been hard for, for my body to persevere, the one constant that was there was my wife. The other constant that was there was my best friend, your pastor. It would have been easily for my wife to say, I, I, I didn't sign up for this. I mean, come on, dude. We've been married five years and, and now you're having back surgery? Or... Come on, man, 16 years, you, you've now had seven surgeries? I mean, in the Bible, seven is completion. Don't you think we've had enough? Amen, absolutely. But she never walked out on me. And in the times that me and your pastor didn't necessarily see eye to eye or agree on how ministry should take place, we kept persevering with one another. 
because of that unity that was there, that was the bond of Christ within us, that spirit bearing witness with his spirit and my spirit and drawing us and knitting us together like Jonathan and David where our souls are as one to where when I refer to him, I refer to him as a brother from another mother. And I don't refer to Job and Caleb's grandma Kelly as Miss Louise or, or Miss Kelly. I refer to her as Mama Kelly. I mean, you can, you can go on our website. You listen to my sermons online if Louise is there and I talk about your pastor, which I do a lot because I got a lot of great examples. <laughs> I'll say, isn't that right, Mama Kelly? And she'll say, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's my baby. And when we go to the greatest restaurant in the world where she works, the chick of the filet on Woodruff Road, I will come out and if Brad is with me, she will introduce me. She will say, this is my son Brad from New Mexico and this is my other son, my pastor Brad. And if I go in there by myself, and I love to go in there by myself because I will stop by to see Louise and, and she'll hug me. Oh, it's so good to see you. And I'll say, Louise, can we take a selfie right quick? I'll take a selfie. I'll send it to him. <laughs> Guess who I hugged today? <laughs> he, does. he does. Why? Because I love this man. And his mother is like a surrogate mother. And when I talk about her, mom and dad, I may say my father-in-law, but they are my familia. I mean, they are my second mother and my second father. And, and that is the dynamic that has existed when there is this true bond of friendship that is created. And when we think about the church body, when we think about what God is wanting to do here at Del Norte, and you as an individual think about the friendships that you have, when you think about those friendships, are you a true friend or are you a fair weather friend? I mean, I mean, are, are you a friend that is always looking out for the well-being of the body or for yourself? Because a true friend understands it's not about me. It's about taking care of my friend. We were up at Camp Enlow for the men's retreat and my dear friend goes to pick out the room that we will stay in. And he picks the room furthest down the hallway, not only from where we will be meeting, but from the restroom and the kitchen. And I'm like, dude, do you want to stay outside? I mean, you know, can we get any further? And we go in and there's a double bed and there's a single bed. And it became this, you take this bed. No, you take this bed. Oh, you take it, you take it. And he left. And when he came back, I had taken the single bed and I had put my stuff there and I had made his bed for him because I defer to my friends. I would rather be a blessing to them than a blessing to me. And when we are true friends with one another, when we as the body function as God intends for the body of believers to function, my friends, the world looks at it with amazement and wonderment and says, how in the world can all of those different people from different backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds and age brackets and preferences, how is it that they are able to function together? And it opens up an opportunity to share about Christ. And it opens up an opportunity to talk about this friend that the word of God talks about that said, you know what? If, if you'll be my friend, I'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus said, I, I'll be that friend that I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. I don't care how bad you mess up. I don't care how rotten a day you have. I'm going to be that friend that's there. And not only that, am I going to truly be your best friend here on earth? I'm going to be your best friend for all of eternity. Jesus is talking with his disciples and he's trying to get them to understand that the time of his departure is growing. And they said, we, we, we don't understand what you're saying. And he says, guys, listen, listen to what I'm telling you. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, 
there you may be also. And they said, but we don't know where you're going and, and how, how can we find the way? And Jesus says, I am the way. And Jesus says, I am the truth and I am the life and no man comes to the Father but by me. Because Jesus said, there will be many that in that day will say, Lord, Lord, did we not attend Del Norte Baptist Church? Lord, Lord, did we not serve at Powdersville First Baptist Church? Lord, Lord, did we not go on mission trips down to Nicaragua? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You were never called a friend of mine. But the invitation is there. The invitation is there that he says that, you know what? Even while you were still a sinner, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die for you. So that when you stand before my heavenly father, he doesn't see you. He sees me. And he doesn't see your righteous deeds, but he sees my righteousness because I'm your friend. I've had people over the last several days that have made different comments about my physical condition right now. Let me be honest with you. Traveling out here with my wife was not convenient. But there was a mutual friend that invited me to come to be with you. And I could have made up every excuse in the book. Brad, my leg hurts. I can't sleep. I can't stand when I preach. I had to sit down. But there came that time that I said, you know what? I'm going to persevere. My friend, if, if there is something that God is calling you to do, there will always be the ability to make an excuse or to find a reason not to. But there comes that point in time that we just have to be willing to. To do what the old song used to say, to say, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and serve him in his presence daily live. I surrender it all. Let me tell you something, when, when you're a true friend to someone here on earth, that's what you're saying. I, I'm surrendering it all to you because I desire friendship with you so much that I'm willing to lay down my preference for your betterment. And when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, it is not a, do you want to give your heart to Jesus as we have said for generations, but it is, do you want to surrender your life to him? Jesus didn't say, if any man wants to come after me, let him lay down his heart and follow me. Jesus said, if any man wants to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. There's a big difference between a heart commitment and a life commitment. Have you ever made that life commitment to that friend named Jesus that said, I'll be that friend that'll never leave you, that'll never forsake you, and I'm that friend that loves you more than any friend you'll ever have down here?